Paleo Rewind, as you may or may not be familiar with, is an annual series created by the Expeditioners Discovery Guild, which sets out to document some of the most notable, important, and all interesting discoveries throughout the year, involving the collaboration of a great number of content creators who also primarily produce videos on paleontology. This time around, I'm covering the month of September, continuing on from Spino Dude, who has covered August. After every creator has uploaded their video, a compilation video will be uploaded on the Edge channel. And while it's sure to be a lengthy one, it will most definitely be worth it. Hadrosauridae, which contains two subfamilies, both Sorolophinae, animals like Edmontosaurus, and Olympiosaurinae, animals like Parasaurolophus, were a very successful group of animals, with them having a cosmopolitan range and very high taxonomic diversity. Their success has often been attributed to the highly specialised mammals, although their foraging strategies remain unclear. In extant herbivores, big shape reflects the types of consumed plants and what one cell targets, and alongside locomotion strategies and proportions also does the same. The first study to be covered for this video went over this very discussion, and how these two groups may have differed in their feeding, and what this could therefore mean for both the niches they both took up, and how they each interacted with each other. Using hadrosaurid big shape and limb segment proportions as proxies of both food selection and locomotor cost respectively, the final dataset used amassed up to 13 taxa, covering animals of all different size ranges. Both subfamilies are likely to have coexisted in the same spaces, as suggested by a few bone beds mainly in America and China, and so they most definitely were ecologically competitive amongst each other to some extent. What was found regarding the big shapes was that hadrosaurinae beaks were generally anteriorly narrower, posteriorly wiser, and dorsal eventually shallower than lambiosaurinae beaks and that they were statistically different enough to be an intrinsic difference, and not just an allometric or growth-related artefact. This suggests a slight difference in their feeding strategies, with the Lambiosaurines seeming to have more of a tendency to have more bulk-consuming behaviour with less selectivity than Sorolophines, indicating that they were eating generally lower-quality foods, also having better adaptations for grinding their food to do so when compared to Sorolophines, which were the opposite. In addition, their limb proportions show that they also differ quite a bit there too, Although more generally, as it was found that Sorolophines had short and proximal limb segments than Lambiosaurines, and that coastal dwelling hadrosaur forelimbs as a whole were shorter when compared to ones from more inland environments. Said shorter forelimbs appear better suited for temporary bipedalism than when compared to longer ones, that which also indicates differing adaptations to feeding heights, potentially down to differing regional vegetation. The longer proximal but shorter distal limb segments of sorolophines would have provided them with greater stability, or they were higher cost, regarding the swinging of the limbs due to an apparent increase in the gyration, whereas the more energy efficient proportions of the lambiosaurines indicates that they may have foraged in larger areas, although said difference still needs to be looked into some more. In conclusion, we still have much to learn about the differing habitats and food preferences these large and often overlooked animals took part in, and studies like these really go a long way in helping to understand them and how these two groups differed. Thalassochnus, the only genus of their subfamily, Thalassochnae, is among the most unusual members of an already unusual group, being the Xenarthrans, which includes living sloths, anteaters, and armadillos, being among some of the earliest branching clades among placental mammals. Interpreters, and known to be semi-aquatic in nature, potentially being preyed upon by raptorial sperm whales, and foraging off of the coast of Miocene and Pliocene, Peru and Chile, where they were known to be confined to until now. Remains from the radius, ulna, and part of an articulated left manus were recently found from the upper member of the Tafna formation in the eastern Puna, Argentina, being the first remains of them being found in a continental setting. The specimen for morphological and phylogenetic analysis appears to be most closely related to the most basally branching and less adapted of the group to marine habitats having the possibility of having a more frugivorous or omnivorous diet. This is quite the important find, since its location is more than 1,171 kilometres away from the Peruvian locality, and 750 kilometres away from the nearest ones in Chile, which greatly extends their range from more typically coastal environments to terrestrial ones, and that their evolutionary and paleobiogeographic history is more complex than was previously known. A diverse group of marine diapsids, most derived plesiosaurs fall into either one of the two body forms. Those with proportionally small heads and elongated necks, which clade within the plesiosauroids, are most well known from animals like Dolly Carincops, and a newly described animal that lived alongside them in the Western Interior Seaway has managed to add to this group's understanding. Serpentisucops from the Lake Cretaceous of Wyoming in the Pierre Shale 
is notable for having both the large, elongated jaws of their group, alongside a long neck with around 23 vertebrae, which may have aided them in being more able to engage in rapid, lateral striking to snag fast and small prey. Their name derives from the Latin serpent, meaning snake, sucus meaning crocodile, and ops meaning face, with their species name Mephistere being named for Anna Feister, the landowner whose generosity afforded both the excavation and donation of the type specimen. Composed of a partial skull, lower jaw, vertebral column, plus a left ilium and pubis. Embedded in fine grey shale, they were quite sizeable animals, at about 7 metres in length, with phylogenetic analysis finding that their long necks were a secondarily derived trait, and one convergence with thus of both ancestral plesiosaurs and contemporaneous elasmosaurids. Titanosaurian sauropods are known for animals like Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan for being able to reach among the largest sizes known for terrestrial vertebrate life, and showing just how far anatomical boundaries can be pushed. Some, however, were quite a bit smaller and more modest, including one of the newest described of their group, being among the smallest of all sauropods known, being named Iberania parva. Their name comes from a combination of the words Ibera, the municipality where the specimens were recovered from, and Dania, a modified form of the Greek word Plania, meaning wanderer. Their specific name of Parva is derived from the Latin word Parvus, which means small, after, well, their apparent small size, and the full name coming out as Little Ibera slash Tree Wanderer. Dating from the Upper Cretaceous, Santonian through Campanian ages, this new taxon has an estimated body length of about 5.7 metres, with them being confirmed through histological and CT scan analyses that they were indeed represented by skeletally mature individuals, in spite of how tiny they seem when compared to their relatives. Phylogenetic research has recovered them as a part of the subfamily Saltosaurinae, a clade which is generally known for containing sauropods on the smaller end of the spectrum. The first of their kinds to be reported to be living in Brazil, Saltosaurians appear to display a conspicuous reduction in their body size as a general occurrence, which has been theorised as either a response to geographical restriction to the vast north and south corridor of the Andean region, or potentially in regards to them occupying new environments previously occupied by other genera. Said environments where they lived were similar to today, inland and arid, which is presumed by the authors of the study as the reason behind their dwarfism to conserve energy which is in contrast to other dwarf sauropods like Magurosaurus and Europosaurus, which attain their short statures because of island dwarfism. Something also interesting to note is the pathologies present on them, with one having acute osteomyelitis or bone swelling from some kind of injury in their fibula, and having fossilised parasites associated with said bone lesions, with this being the first report of parasites preserved in situ inside the vascular canals of a dinosaur. The taxonomy of these most unusual microfossils is currently under study by the rest of the team who carried out the study of the sauropods, so time will tell as to the identity of these even smaller organisms. Pagicephalosaurs are a group of generally small ornithischians that are most well known for the reinforced frontal and parietal bones that are fused into a thickened skull dome, with it being a prime source of research and speculation as to how their dome functions with it being implicated in intraspecific head button contests, whether they be head on head or head on flank. Despite their general lack of postcranial material, their solid heads usually being the only pieces of anatomy to be preserved, the few that do show quite some unusual morphology. Their hind limbs are relatively stout when compared to other bipedal ornithischians, and their torso and pelvic regions are comparably broad as well, alongside a tail base that is also very wise and surrounded by a caudal basket of ossifications unique to their group. Stegocerus is one of the best known and also best preserved of their group, and so were recently used for a study that will soon be covered that reconstructed the appendicular myology, the musculature system of a pachycephalosaur for the first time, as well as providing a detailed consideration of the functioning of the postcranium when it comes to the use in purported headbutting events. Stegocerus velism was found to have enlarged muscle attachment sites, with key muscles like the corda femoralis and ischiocordalis being sizeable. This, coupled with the wide pelvis, stout hind limbs, as well as the rossified tails, produces a very stable structure, which would help to keep the animals steady when engaging in conflicts with each other, as is pretty evident that they did given their, all of their adaptations. From this, it's clear that the post crania allow them to be more effective headbusters slash rammers than they would be otherwise, with them being adapted to both receive large forces and then deliver them back. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of Paleo Rewind and hopefully you learned something new about the discoveries and all descriptions made for the month of September. With that, I'll see you next time, whatever that may be.